Hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you as ever from Vitality Stadium. We're once again here to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club, be it staff, players, former players or management. Now we've had a little bit of a winter break ourselves with the World Cup going on, but for those who are new to our podcast, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm joined as ever by my colleague Neil Perrett. Neil, it's been a while, lots has happened. We're currently in the middle of the transfer window and at the start of a new year. How have you been? That'll be very well actually, Zoe, but I'm just still waiting for my Christmas present from you. It hasn't arrived yet. That's funny. I think there's something to do with postal strikes or or something like that that we can possibly blame that on. (laughs) Really looking forward to the uh, second half of the season. I think it's going to be a really exciting time. Absolutely. We're well, talking of exciting. We've got a really exciting guest today who is known as Mr. Community. Having been at the club for 20 years and growing the Community Sports Trust hugely over that time, there's plenty to get our teeth stuck into. More recently, he's taken on management of the women's team who have also gone from strength to strength and we continue to climb up the female football pyramid. So without further ado, we're delighted to welcome Steve Cuss onto our official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Steve, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Thanks, Zoe. Yeah, I'm very good, thank you. A little bit embarrassed with the Mr. Community, but um, thanks for the intro. <laughs> we couldn't leave it out. We're going to actually start right back at the beginning, so I'm going to ask you to cast your mind back. Tell us just a little bit more about your first job in football. I think Centre of Excellence Director at, at Torquay. Yeah, I went back at my hometown club, Torquay. Um, started coaching there, um, really but goes back a bit before that in terms of playing there and it's a totally different system to, to, to what it is now with academies and development and uh, at that age at 16, 17 I was trying to get into the uh, to the Torquay Academy, Torquay youth team there and um, it was a straight letter with a, it was a letter because I still got that letter, I still hold on to it with a straight yes or no and it was a no for me at the time so you had a heartbroken young football player around and um, little bit lost about what to do really so I took myself off to college went on a sports course and really fortunate at that time that football and community just started and um, Torquay had appointed uh, what turned out to be a great appointment in the community officer of Frank Prince and um, he was looking for some coaches to work at the first soccer school and um, I thought I'd put my name in the hat and hadn't done much coaching before I was still fairly young and they asked me to do it and I absolutely loved it and got the bug for coaching from that day onwards and um, managed to do more and more within the community at Torquay to the day that they offered me a a full-time job and that was a really special day because my dad takes me to go and watch Torquay and it's my hometown club and I went home and told him I got a full-time job at at his club as as we all say our club don't we and uh, you know it's a proud moment to be able to tell my tell my dad that and um, worked within community for 10 years now the great mentor in Frankie he showed me all the ropes and what to do and 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 how to develop programs and engage with uh, with the community so I was always keen on the coaching and I was doing my coaching qualifications and got my UEFA B license in the year 2000 and um, I think in Devon at that time there was only four other people that had that qualification so Naturally, it led me to some job offers in terms of of, of that centre of excellence work, and um, Torquay offered me the centre of excellence uh, uh, role, uh, the manager there. So again, I big decision because I love the community work, but I took it. And um, obviously, we were fairly way low down the pyramid, and two years into that job, they decided they were going to scrap the youth policy for a period of time and, and reshape it, which meant I probably needed to look for a new job. And um, off I went looking for a new job and that's what got me here to uh, to Bournemouth. Uh, the same week I went for a, an interview for a community job at Crystal Palace. I've got to admit, me and my wife Anne went up for the interview and uh, we were totally lost. I was uh, I was a young lad from, from Devon in London and the bright lights and the busyness of it, I was lost and the interview didn't go great. Later on the same week I came to an interview here at Bournemouth and uh, I thought it went quite well. I was re- reasonably pleased with the interview, and as I'm as I'm driving back home, I get the call from the club that that they've offered me the job. So it was uh, a big move at the time. I had a young family and um, had to make some big decisions about whether we were going to up sticks and move. But 20 years later, it's uh, it's been a good choice. Steve, did you keep playing when you'd had that rejection from the pro club? But did you sort of keep playing non-league around there? Yeah, I was playing non-league in, in Devon and in around the Torquay area. But I, I must admit that, that the coaching bug got me and I wanted to, to continue to coach. So I was I was going on many different courses. I was going out and looking at different coaches. I had Frank who I was working with. 
And even when I was playing, I still had my coach's hat on and I was thinking about what I would do as a coach and as a manager. And I really got the bug for it. And it was it was that that took me up there. And then it was around about 28 that I probably really went for the coaching roles rather than who I signed for as a player um, because of, I could see that that was where my, my future was going to be. But difficult as a young lad because when you get, and we see it all the time within football, don't we? When you get when you get that rejection, there's that there's that big disappointment, and um, you know you've got to bounce back from that. But you need a little bit of luck in life as well. And I probably think the football and the community starting at that same time that I was having, you know, being rejected as a as as a player was probably the best bit of luck that I could have had because it really introduced me to coaching. Steve, I used to holiday quite a lot down in uh, Torquay. Um, and you said that you didn't fancy the Crystal Palace move, but even moving from Torquay to Bournemouth must have been quite a big decision for you. Yeah, they didn't offer me the Crystal Palace one, and I don't blame them. The interview, I think the whole day, I, we travelled up to London and it was busy and, you know, Torquay's a nice, quiet little place. And uh, I think we were like rabbit in the headlights a little bit and we were out of our depth. And um, yeah, the interview, you know, I come out of it and we were travelling home and we said... I'm not sure this is for us. This is not right where we are in our life right now. But I got a nice feel when I come to Bournemouth. Um, the call back home when I got offered the job, I, I stopped in the lay-by and my wife didn't come with me to, to up to the end. I travelled up here with my mum on that day and uh, I phoned down my wife and uh, there was a few tears because she knew that she knew that it was a good opportunity for me and she knew that we had to take that offer to come up to Bournemouth and, and take the job. But all our family was in Torquay, both Anne and my family. So we were the only ones that were going to be moving away. I had three young children. Uh, Gemma, my oldest, was nine. And then we had Amy, seven. And Robbie was only five. So a huge decision to take them away from their family and friends and out of their school life. But Anne wanted to do it. And I certainly wanted to do it. And um, she backed me. And um, yeah, it was a big decision. But it felt right. It, I always describe Bournemouth as uh, pretty similar to Torquay, but a bit more modern and a bit more bigger, but seaside places. Steve, the uh, the club had just been relegated into what was then Division 3, November 2002, I think it was, when you joined. Just tell us about the club that you walked into, a very different club to the one we're seeing now, and tell us about some of the people who were here then as well. Yeah, it was really strange bit because obviously I had to go through putting a notice period in at Torquay, and I put my month's notice in to say that I was moving to Bournemouth, and, and a, just a strange coincidence of the fixtures, Torquay played Bournemouth during my month's notice and Bournemouth were doing well in the league and they came down to play more and uh, uh, Torquay won 4-0 on the night. And I was thinking, wow, you know, what am I moving to here? It's like, this could be a, this could be an interesting season. But I came up in the November and I actually don't think I saw the team lose uh, until the last day of the season. They were on an incredible season and, and it got to the, to the playoff final and... Uh, promotion against Lincoln at the Millennium Stadium. So it quickly turned around, but it was uh, most definitely a different football club, uh, as you can appreciate, obviously in the Premier League now to Division 3 back then. Not so many staff around, not so many of the departments that we've got now, um, but some really great people. And some of those people are still here at the football club as well, which I think says a lot about the football club in the fact that people do want to stay here and work here. It's a, it's a great place to, to be, but... Yeah, it was certainly a different place. Um, perhaps the the stadium wasn't full every game. Um, I remember the free sides, the open ends, um, because I obviously do a lot of community tours and um, showing groups around. And um, you know that was a, that was a big feature at the time was was the open ends there. Um, but my you know my initial feelings was so I got made to feel very well. I felt home straight away. There was never. I don't recall, and it was a long time ago, but I don't ever recall being homesick once. I didn't think that we had a conversation about going back to Torquay. And to be honest, we call Bournemouth home now. And I think that's down to the, to the, to the fantastic club that this is. Just before we move on to your role in the community, Steve, I know that, uh, and a lot of people listening will know that you've kept your hand in on the coaching side of it with, with the non-league teams, Paul Town and, and Wimborne Town around here. You say you're still very keen on that. Yeah, it's interesting because I think the community roles developed. Uh, you know, I started in the community as a football coach and when people ask me what my job is, I say I'm a football coach. I think that's the hardest thing. I'm still trying to explain to my mother-in-law what I do on a daily basis that it's a difficult job to explain when you say you're head of community. But in a simple terms, I consider myself as a football coach and um, 
that's what I love. I, I tend to lose myself in, in, in the passion of coaching and I, I love coaching. And um, when I came here to Bournemouth, I got involved with the, uh, the academy, the centre of excellence that was here, various different age groups, uh, really enjoyed working with the under 16s and had a few good players in that under 16 period of time that have gone on and, and, and done very well. And then I got introduced to Tom Killick at, at Poole and who was looking for a coach and they'd just gone into the Wessex Premier Division and um, asked if I'd come along and help out with some coaching. And yeah, we did really well there and um, I enjoyed working with Tom. You know, we we're opposites and probably that's what we worked well together. But we, um, uh, you know, we won the Wessex League three years in a row and had some good success at Poole Town. And I enjoyed working and the challenges with those players because it's a most definitely a different setup in terms of coming out of an academy where everything is very disciplined and perhaps going into the non-league, you've got to deal with people's work-life balance and missing training for different reasons. And obviously we've done well at Pool Town. And again, I'm always ambitious as a coach and got offered the uh, the job at Wimborne. Um, and um, yeah, took that. Uh, really nice club, Wimborne. Great, fantastic people there. Probably had didn't have the budget that um, that maybe some have had since then, but it's but it was a fantastic club to work for, and I'm proud of our achievements there as well. We we got a higher Southern League appearance, got to the first round of the FA Trophy, and a couple of senior cup finals as well. So I've always enjoyed going out coaching, and um, but I was ready for a bit of a break at Wimborne. It came at a time when the uh, club here, AFC Bournemouth, forgot to the Premier League, and I felt like I was missing out on it. I wanted to enjoy the Premier League like everybody did and I wasn't coming to games because obviously I was manager of Wimborne. I'd been manager there for a little while. I needed a rest. I think I needed to recharge a little bit. I think Wimborne needed somebody else as well. So, you know, it's time to step down from that and uh, took a little bit of a break before then going into to the women's job that I've currently got now. Tell us something about Charlie Austin that we don't know. Oh, Ch- Charlie's a great lad. Absolutely fantastic lad. I mean... It is true when he walked in, obviously he was a very, very young lad who it was 18 years old. He walked into um, to the pre-season training and, and Tom and myself, it wasn't something that blew us away. You know, we, we were, I remember the, the opening day of the season at Brockenhurst and there was a conversation between us whether we were going to select him or not. Is he going to start today? Is he not going to start? And, you know, Tom as the manager makes those decisions and um, he made a good decision that day in starting Charlie. He scored the goal that won the game that day and obviously the rest is history. He went on, but... The night that Swindon come to, to look at him wasn't his best night, which is the interesting part of the story. He's obviously been scoring lots of goals for Paul and there was a huge amount of attention. And I I'd, I'd got him in here with um, Eddie at the time um, to come in and train with the first team. So he's, he was having that experience, although the club was under a, a transfer embargo at the time. Um, but yeah, he, he, he came, came to watch Danny Wilson and... Um, he didn't have his best nights, Charlie. So I think there were initially there was a feeling of a little bit of disappointment, but obviously he saw enough in him and made the offer. And I think it was the big standout with Charlie was his last game. I think it was away at Moneyfields and I think he got five on that day. We knew he was going. We knew he was going after that weekend and um, uh, he scored five on that day and what a send off and obviously had a great career. But yeah, a young lad who'd, who'd worked really, really hard to get back into the game and he's had a great career and obviously back at Swindon now. Moving on, just tell us a little bit more about the Community Sports Trust for those people who are listening who, who might not know as much about it. Yeah, I think it's a, a developing role. Uh, like I say, when it started as football in a community, I've got this little phrase, it's it's about a, a coach going out there with a bag of balls and in just playing football. And I think over the course of the 20 years that I've been in the role, I've seen a huge change in it. It's so much more than just kicking a ball. Um, we at AFC Bournemouth want to keep that we, a lot of our projects that we go out and engage with uh, children, adults, involve a football. But we look at what's needed in our local community now and we put on lots of different projects to meet the needs of our community, which is fantastic. When I do get a chance to just reflect a little bit, it's it's with real pride that we're able to look at what our community needs and I understand what our community needs and then able to go and react to it. I've got to say, I've got a fantastic team of what is now 35 full-time staff within the community department and when we started it was just myself and one part-time member of staff so to build it up to that level to the to the amount of people that we're working with and doing some of the work that we're working with now it it, perhaps when it first started it was just for the people that could access it Um, 
who wanted to play football, but now we've got the stadium open in the evenings and weekends and bringing people in and going out and engaging with different people on lots of different projects. So, you know, it's a real developing role community and one that I'm very proud of. For you, how much work goes into, you know, the off the field stuff as well? Because we always see you out there coaching sessions. We always see the mini kickers, the women's team, whoever it, it may be. But there must be people out there that you've coached that you've seen a real kind of growth within individually and also you do a lot of classroom work as well how important is is the off-field stuff as such in comparison to you know what you do do on the grass yeah I think it's really important I get a little bit embarrassed when people say I, I, I do so many hours and put a lot of work in I uh I like to be on the field that's where I feel comfortable in and people know me I'm not the normal head of community who wears a suit I put a tracksuit on every single day and I try to get out to at least one practical activity a day but obviously my role is to, to to oversee a lot of the governance I've got a really good team behind me that people just don't see so they just think that I do all the work and again I, I mentioned my my wife Anne who's 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 part of that backroom team that do a lot of the uh, organization and paperwork and making sure that everything's ready for us to go out there and deliver we brought in some some fantastic staff over that period of time and um, that gives me great credit as well um, or great a great um a sense of joy and pride in seeing some of the young lads and, and girls that are working for me now because I've taught them in schools and uh, I've seen their development as well and follow them and, um, you know, they've kept in contact with me and then they've asked for a job and we brought them into a community and, and, and developed and, and I'm seeing them turn into uh, good adults first and foremost, which I think is important, but um, good community coaches, which is uh, vital for our development of our programmes. It's obviously a, a self-funding non-profit organisation. You've said how much it has grown over the last 20 years. How much further can it grow? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I hope it keeps going. It, it surprises me all the time. And um, I, I think that's the what gives me the biggest joy as well in terms of, yeah, I was the football coach, but now we're running a business and uh, it is a it's charitable business, uh, non, not non-for-profit. So we've got to generate grants and bring in income and, you know, that. It's not something that come naturally to me, so I've got to learn how to do that. So I've 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 learned how to do that and learn how to run a business and um, uh, develop that. But I see it developing every day, and that's what excites me. And I think that's what you know. I've not fought once in the twenty years that I want to change my job. Uh, you know, I like I love getting up in the morning. It gives me a, a a different challenge every day. Whether it's coaching those mini kickers, the four year olds that we coach on a Saturday and Sunday. I've got to be there even before a women's team match. I just think that whatever goes on, however stressful I am, however busy I am, being out on the pitch with the four-year-olds at mini kickers shows what it's all about because we were all that four-year-old once and that's what it's all about. So how about when it's snowing outside and it's minus four degrees? There's not a single part of you that thinks, oh, today could be a long day. No, 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 never. I always want to go out there. The only thing I would say is that I put a pair of trousers on now. I used to be shorts every day of the year. When I was uh, started off, and again, I think you follow your mentor and uh, Frank Frank at Torquay, Frank Prince, uh, he gave us our kit, but he didn't give us any trousers. He said, we're just going to wear shorts every day. And, you know, I was a young lad then and we just and probably a little bit warmer in Torquay as well, but it's a bit further down south. But I came up here and uh, I wore trousers, every uh, shorts every single day. And um, I'm a little bit older now. It's uh, a little bit colder. I put the tracksuit trousers on, but I still love going out there every day. And uh, it's obviously been frosty and cold, but training session last night and more training sessions today. It's it's great. And it's uh, a, a, you know, a real privilege to do that. You could, you could get a job as a postman. I think my postman throughout the cold <laughs> spell that we've had this month has worn shorts every day when he's delivered post it's just I think there must be some sort of competition amongst them to see who's the, the bravest or something like that Steve go right back to the very first day you walked in to your office wherever that was and just tell us your what you walked into your memories of what you were seeing there yeah I had um I had an office on the back of the club shop the superstore as it is now um there was uh, uh, one member of staff part-time who was working in with community. There'd been a period of six months where no community officer was in place. So the diary that was in front of me was three sessions. So that's all we had for the for the whole of the week. Um, two after school clubs and uh, a disability session, Ability Counts, which was still running to this day. So 20 years later, that's still going, which is great. And that was it. Um, but that really excited me because it gave me the uh, the the blank canvas, if you like, to say right, okay, we can put 
our stamp on this or put my stamp on it about what we want to deliver. So we quickly set up some uh, some community sessions and got to know the local community. But yeah, the football club was uh, was an interesting place then. And like I say, there wasn't too many people around. Uh, I remember going out for lunch on day one and I thought I was underdressed, but it was OK. It was uh, um, Sean Driscoll, the manager, uh, come and knocked on the door and said, do you want to go out for lunch and, um, and have a quick chat? And off we went to, to the cafe across the road and uh, we had a great chat. But Sean was at that time really really fantastic for me um he was he was somebody that really wanted to to engage with community so to have a manager and lots of managers since that have have equally been engaging with community but sean was fantastic in 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 the fact that you know he allowed me to use the players to to enhance our projects and uh, the players then understood about coming out into the community and they're willing to do that and some of those players now are uh on the coaching staff here at Bournemouth. So I think it's, again, it shows what the club's all about. That'll be the Kings Park Cafe and the other cafes are available, Steve. Yeah, Kings Park's great cafe. Yeah, we all go across the road there, don't we, to, to use that facility. But, you know, I think I, I came in and thought that, you know, the manager was taking me out for uh, for lunch a little bit and uh, we ended up at, uh, at the, the cafe across the road, which is, like I say, a great cafe and we've all been there. Steve, like I said, it was Division 3 we were in, then it was the bottom flight Steve, the Premier League must have looked an awful long way away in those days. Yeah, I've got to be honest. It's it, I don't think anybody ever thought of the Premier League. I remember the, starting on the Monday, I think we had a Johnston's Paint Trophy or Leyland Daff Cup, whatever it was called at the time against, I think it was Leighton Orient on a Tuesday night. I think it was about 1,700 people here for the game. And, you know, you look back from there to to, to going into the Premier League, but we never, we never ever thought about the Premier League uh, I think we're probably in survival mode a lot of the times then. I, I remember a call with the uh, the Football League when we were bottom of uh, of the league and we looked like we were going out of, of, of the Football League. I was having conversations with the, the community team at, at the EFL or Football League as it was then about what does that mean? What does it mean for our community department if we drop out? Because they only really support and funded at that particular time was the EFL clubs. So we would have fallen out and if we'd have dropped out of that, you know, we may not have been here as as what we are now, certainly not what we are now, but it would have been difficult to carry on there. And, you know, we are self-funding and when, when you have all those um, avenues taken away from you, that would have been very difficult. So, you know, that was a real pressure time, you know, it was difficult to know when your future, if, you, if you're living for, you know, basically today and not sure what tomorrow is going to bring, that was difficult time. And for somebody who was new to running a business as what it, well, we've talked about before it, it is a business that that's difficult that was difficult and um you know i had to to rely on the strength of a lot of people and and the strong people that were here at the football club to get us through that but then we went on this magical journey didn't we and um one that we could never ever thought that was going to happen and i think it goes back to when we first started and eddie got given that given that job and we got on that role that you know that great escape season was something else it was we, we we looked dead and buried and it was so far behind and it I remember going into that January and thinking yeah we've got not not got a chance but fortunately one man thought we did and uh, galvanized the whole football club and we got on this incredible run but it kept on going it kept on going and uh, that night here against Bolton was probably one of the most memorable nights we've had at the football club when when we knew we were going to the Premier League and the, the scenes there and uh, was was fantastic and uh, I think the one that stands out for me is that 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 just just to kind of like put where we were and in the map is when we played Manchester United here and I looked up at the big screen on 89 minutes and it said Cherries 2 United 1 and you think to yourself wow how's this happened we're beating Manchester United how how does this happen so Incredible journey and, um, yeah, brought joy to a lot of supporters and a lot of staff. Just tell us about how being in the Premier League impacts on the Community Sports Trust because a, lot's are made, a lot is made of all the money that football clubs get when they're in the Premier League, but that has a trickle-down effect for you, I believe. Yeah, it does. Um, the EFL uh, do a wonderful job in supporting the 72 clubs, um, but obviously they've got 72 clubs and the Premier League have their 20 they provide us with some funding to do some core activities that they want us to do. And obviously the Premier League's funding for that is is greater uh, than that of the EFL. So that provides us with uh, a strong financial base to really push on and add to our community, uh, one, staffing levels, but two, the amount of work that we do and the amount of projects that we offer. So the, the um, 
bit about being in the Premier League to compared with the FL, it does have an effect on right down to community as well. Steve, you said you did, well, you, not you, but beforehand, three sessions were in the diary in that first week when you came in. How many sessions are you doing now? Yeah, the last count and uh, we, we tend not to stop. We just can, tend to keep going. But I, I, I have, as I've got a bit older, tried to take a bit of time out to do a bit more reviewing uh, of what we do. But at the moment, we're delivering about 150 sessions a week, um, reaching around four and a half thousand people. Um, and as Zoe said earlier, that's not just out on the field, that's within the classroom setting as well. We know our fan base uh, very, very well. And we know that not everybody wants to be active. Um, some people want to have a look at it through an education point of view. Um, currently, we're running uh, adult fitness classes and engaging with a lot of adults in helping them get back to or kickstarting them into a, into a fitness regime. So we understand what our, our community need and um, we adjust to that. But yeah, about four and a half thousand people a week that we see it on, on, on a weekly basis. And that's every week of the year. I know you can't tell us about all of the sessions, Steve, but just... Sort of give us a, a taste of some of the sessions that you do. Yeah, we have a strong emphasis on education. We believe, well, I believe strongly that if we can get young people off to a, off to a really good education and um, that will set them up for, for a really strong life. And um, I feel that football club can play a part in that. Probably 20 years ago, I didn't quite realise what part they can play in it, but I've seen some really good stories that we, we can share the, in terms of how we've helped shape young people's education because um, there was one at uh, uh, a local primary school where just one young lad just wasn't conforming. He wasn't wearing his school uniform and wasn't really behaving himself in class. And I was able to take one of the players with me into into the school and it was Steve Cook, who's uh, obviously at Forest now. And we talked to Steve about uh, does he get training kit that he has to wear? I set it up a little bit, obviously, but does he have to wear training kit the same as every other player's? And uh, he said, yeah. And I said, what, what would happen if you didn't wear that training kit? And he said, well, I'd get myself in trouble. But more importantly, you know, I've let my teammates down. And um, the young lad was listening to Steve's every single word. I went back into school the week after and he's wearing his school uniform. And it, that's the power of the player and that's what it can do. And I've got a million and one of those stories where we've impacted those, those individuals. And um, the fact that we're going into schools now and helping on well, reading and numeracy and all aspects of school life is it's really rewarding that we're able to do that. And we have Premier League Primary Stars that does that at primary school level and we have Premier League Inspires that does that at secondary school level. Again, perhaps years gone by, the secondary schools got missed out a little bit, but we feel that we can work really well with the secondary schools there. And we've got Gareth, our project lead, who's doing some outstanding work and really helping young people to make some good decisions that, for them, they'll be better off in later life. And that's down to the football club in allowing me to do my job that we're able to impact on that. There's someone that I want to ask you about, not a school child or anyone, someone that recently turned 100 years old. I think it was, his name was Stan. He came in, he had a little bit of a tour here at Vitality Stadium. Just tell us about him and you know the work that you do with, with those sorts of ages. Yeah, we've got a really strong partnership with you know, Rob Mitchell and the commercial team here at the football club and Care South Project is one that was brought to the community to uh, to go and deliver. And we thought, well, how do we keep playing football with going into residential homes? So we 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 invented this chair football where we all sit down, but we take the footballs in and we and we kick the footballs. And uh, we met Stan and we met some wonderful people in Care South. But um, Stan was turning a hundred, and uh, he was really fit strong man and um uh, always joined in the football and his dream was to come back to uh, to the vitality stadium and um have a little look around so we had a we had a wonderful morning it was one of my favorite days of last year bringing stan into the football club we just sat in the change rooms talking to him about football that's that's what we did for 20 minutes with neil vacher showed him around all the change rooms he walked out through the tunnel we had a little kick of the ball just on the side of the pitch had a fantastic time and um I was able to see him again through going into the care homes, but also he came to our, our Care South Christmas party. And uh, yeah, it was great to see him and give him a little mention, but real kind of like the other end of what I mentioned with the mini kickers. The mini kickers keeps me young and uh, on my toes, I've got to say, when I'm out there with them. But 
being able to sit down with somebody like Stan, who's 100 years old and just talk football. And uh, some of the other staff didn't know what we were talking about with some of the old, old stories we were, we were reminiscing about. But yeah, fantastic uh, character, Stan, and great that we were able to welcome him to the football club. Steve, I was, I was privileged to attend that Care South Christmas party. Um, and I found it quite a moving, moving experience, if I'm honest. Yeah. All the older people there and uh, singing away and, and, and dancing and, and stuff like that. You haven't been taught, to, you've been taught as a football coach. You, that's a life skill that you would have picked up to, to, to deal with situations like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, again, that's something that I can be, um, when I do sit back and look back, how I've been able to develop myself personally. I will say that I wasn't doing any singing or dancing personally. I haven't quite got to those levels yet. Uh, might need a bit more uh, uh, lessons on those before I start doing that. But yeah, the the bit that that I've been able to self-teach and um, been able to do that, I've grown in confidence, surprisingly to maybe a lot of people that I am quite a quiet person. I keep myself to myself. And certainly as a young man, I was, I was really shy to, to think that I can stand up and speak to presentations and conferences and assemblies that I do now I think if I look back and um, you know my mum and dad would have said no I'm not, not sure he's going to have that confidence to do that as, as he grows through but I've been able to to uh, teach myself how to do that um, didn't go to university probably not the same route as a lot of people as I mentioned before straight into a to a work environment but because the job changed I had to change and if I didn't change then I wouldn't be head of community now and I think that's the bit I'm passionate about working for AFC Bournemouth. I'm passionate about being head of community. So I had to change and I had to develop. So I did that through teaching myself. But again, working alongside some really experienced people, I, I study people in, this is my kind of like um, Dawa side now, if you like. I, I enjoy watching people give presentations and speak. Um, and I kind of like study that, whether they're... Uh, reading it off a piece of paper, whether they're doing it from notes, whether they're doing it from auto cue and just try and pick up how they do it, how they make eye contact. Do they look at the audience? Do they not? And over the years, I've just added that to my own kind of like delivery and where I look to try and engage with people. And um, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm, you know, nowhere near perfect, but we try and develop it all the time. And um, most importantly, be there ready for when the community need me in whatever that be, giving a talk, delivering a lesson, putting a football session on, or just being there, like with Stan, talking one-to-one, -one, um, just being ready for whatever they need. Do you find it easy or does it come naturally to you to sort of adapt to the different situations? Because I can certainly imagine in, in your role, as it is the same for, for many of your coaches, no two days are the same. As you say, one minute you're in a classroom, the next minute you're out on the football pitch, then you're perhaps in a in a meeting in, at the stadium or you're talking to Stan or you're doing a Care South coffee morning. How How do you manage sort of that adaption throughout your day? Yeah, it is a challenge. It is a challenge and it's one that I've 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 learned to understand. I think the key to, to, to my role without boring everybody is is doing the preparation. Um I think you, you when when I uh, took the women's team job, my doubt was whether I'd have enough time to be able to 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 really give the job um what it needs. And and again I mentioned my wife a few times now, but uh she she kill me for mentioning her so many times, but uh uh, she was the one that told me to go and do the job and uh, and take it. But you've got to be prepared. And I, I spend a lot of time preparing myself for sessions. So I never go into a school classroom underprepared, overprepared. I've got obviously now a bit of experience with the coaching so I can do a lot of different sessions. But I, I feel what I've really kind of like gained from working in community for 20 years is is reading the room and um, knowing when to change what I need to change. If I need to move something on a little bit quicker or slow it down or change the angle of approach slightly, I've been able to pick those skills up over the year, but it's one that I'm still learning and want to keep learning and want to keep trying to improve myself and get better at. Now, before we move on to more of the women's setup, we're just going to go back to 2008 when the, the Community Sports Trust had gained charitable status. Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was um, it was uh, a directive that came from uh, the Football League uh, around asking all their clubs to go to a charitable status. I think one of the the main objectives was that all the money that was coming into the community then could be ring fenced to go back out into the community, and that was a really good um, opportunity for us then to have uh, a pot of money that we could build up to really then plough back into the community to make a real bit 
big difference. Again, someone said, you've got to take an organization through a charitable status. It was like, how do I do that? You know, I had no idea how to do that. So I had to uh, draw on, again, lots of people's experience and find a way of doing that. But 2008, we got our charitable status and um, the, yeah, that allowed us to to um, apply for a lot more grants and um, bring in different various kind of uh, sponsorships and um, different um, money from different organizations to then be plowed back directly into the community. So that was a big breakthrough in 2008 for... I think a lot of clubs to go charitable status. Steve, I just want to ask you about two of your members of staff, one who will be very familiar with all Bournemouth supporters and one who will be very familiar with all supporters of New Milton Town. So <laughs> Ian Cox, of course, is on the on your staff and as is Ben Cooper. Now, the reason I'm sort of asking you about Ben is because you've mentioned that he was an academy graduate here, didn't get taken on as a pro, but he's still having a career in football. So just tell us about those two guys and what they do. Yeah, two two really good staff members. Like I say, I've got to say my staff are, are absolutely brilliant. But talking about uh, uh, Ben and Ian, Ian's great because we have staff five sides and he can still play. So um, all the young lads who want to be on Ian's team when there's any uh, five side matches going. Um, ben is uh, somebody who uh, had that unfortunate bit. I talked about myself, different kind of era, but Ben came and spoke to me about he wanted to to pursue a coaching career and um I thought he was way above his his age and his maturity and about his sensible approach to what he wanted to do after being released as a as a youth team player so we offered him a we offered him a, a full-time job with us he works with our our college teams uh, 16 to 18 year olds and he's developed into a fantastic coach um developing into a fantastic uh, man manager as well off the pitch he's got some real real qualities about how he looks after the players that he looks afterwards and he's doing really well hard working hard working goes back into the academy and, and works with the younger age groups and also plays for for your your favorite second favorite team Neil New Milton and doing very well scores um he keeps telling us and our lads about the free kicks he scores and everything as well so he's doing very well at, at New Milton but yeah, going up to Ian. Ian, uh, fantastic guy. Um, brilliant for me. Um, somebody who's got a huge amount of experience. I love having conversations with Ian, uh, being able to run through things with Ian. But Ian's, Ian's got a real passion to work with youth engagement and some of the work that he does. A lot of people won't know the work that he does. He works with a lot of young people that have um, slightly lost their way in terms of maybe um, education, um, maybe gone into a little bit of crime. Ian does a lot of work through our programme and our Premier League Kicks targeted programme to help those individuals to get back and um, into education, into employment. And it can be no better person. I've never seen Ian ruffled in any way. He's Mr. Cool, he's Mr. Calm and uh, he was a Rolls Royce of a player. And uh, yeah, he's like that as a staff member for me as well. Going forward, how do you think this new ownership will affect the Community Sports Trust, and and can it be a, it can be a really good thing for it? Surely. Yeah, absolutely. I think like every member of staff here, we're excited about the new era, uh, the new owners coming in. I had the uh, the privilege of meeting Bill, uh, who came out to have a look at the girls under fourteens training session that I was taking. Um, really spoke well to the girls. The girls were really infused to meet the the new owner, and. Um, of course, as a, as Americans, then they, they have a, a big emphasis on pushing uh, community and um, women's sport as well. So we're really excited about that. We've got Jim Ferola in as well, who, who again, is going to really help us push that community and um, uh, women's game side of it as well. But again, I've got to say, you know, we've 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 had great support from from everybody at the club, you know, right for all those years in terms of Rob Mitchell, Liz Finney, Jeff Mostyn, all those people that have supported community and backed me to be able to go out and do my job. But there's no doubt right now it's an exciting place and it's an exciting era and we're one that we're very much looking forward to. Steve, I'm going to ask you to take that hat off now, please, and put your women's manager hat on now because we're going to move on to the second half of the podcast like you said you're a U UEFA licensed coach you obviously can't help that bug you can't let it go and you took on the role of managing the women's team at the start of the 2019-20 season just tell us about that what got you involved I know that the, they are linked with the community sports trust yeah, I think you go back a little bit before and I think they, when I finished at Wimborne, I don't often say I'm tired because I don't like it because it's kind of like says I've been defeated a little bit. But 
I was tired after Wimborne and I needed a I needed a little bit of break. But I think a, a year, year and a half after uh, leaving Wimborne, I think my wife knew that I was itchy to get back in. I started looking at a few jobs and I kept on saying to myself, not another non-league job. Don't take that. That's not for you right now. But then in 2015, I was asked to look at the women's setup here at AFC Bournemouth and um, it was being run at the time by Vince Taylor who was doing a great job but was slightly detached from the club and we wanted to bring it back into the club and we brought it back in uh, with a back in of Neil Blake and um, we appointed a manager at the time in Steve Davis who did a wonderful job in, in moving them forward but it was time for, a, for a, a new manager to come in. We had a little look around I was, yes, I was interested in it, but I was the one that, that was doing the appointment. So it was a bit of a strange one. But so I I almost like appointed myself to to run it because I felt that right there and then I was probably best placed to do it. Um, I didn't, as I said to Zoe earlier, I didn't wasn't quite sure how I was going to do it because the, uh, I don't know how the players do it at times where they work and train in the evening and the commitment and the show to travel all around it on a Sunday. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I could free up enough time to be able to give that job the full value. And what well, I do, I do. I make sure that I give that 100% every time in terms of planning, preparation and trying to take on the team. So, yeah, I put my coaching boots back on and uh, took on the women's team and um, and coincided with my first season was was a COVID season, but we were top of the league at the time and um, nearly nearly over the line in terms of promotion and, and the FA decided that, the leagues would be as they were when we got promoted and now play at national league level and um, carrying on developing the team and trying to move it forward, which uh, I think we've done year on year with the women's team to, to where they are right now. How different is it managing a women's team to managing a, a men's team or is there no difference? There is difference. Yeah, definitely. There's there's the obvious difference around being in the changing rooms at certain certain times. You know, obviously when I was manager of men's teams, you could stay in and around the changing rooms uh, uh, but we we uh, have very like set procedures where I come in and speak to the players, come out, leave them. They know what time they've got to be on the pitch and they come and meet us out on the pitch for the warm up. And the women's game is very much different at the end of the game as well. There's always there's always a huddle in there where we do our uh, uh, bit of uh, debrief at the end. And any spectators and supporters that are watching the women's players always go over to them before going back into the change room. So there is a there is a little bit of difference, but. Um, I'm sure the players will will say that um, you know I'm hard on them. I, I want the best out of them. I've I've got probably high standards and want the best out of the players all the time and um, drive them to be the best that they can be. And we work really hard on the training pitch because I believe that's where you get better. Um, so training is a big big part of what I what I want for my players to then try and perform on on the pitch uh, on a Sunday, which. Um, you know, I have to say over my three years now as the manager, the players have been fantastic and have been a pleasure to work with. Steve, you've 18 months you've been in the National League set up now. That was a massive step from tier five, effectively, which, which you were in. Just tell us how, what differences you've noticed in the step up. Yeah, we know it's a big difference in the set up. Uh, set up. There's the, I'm sure the supporters have as well. Yeah, I think there's gone of the, the, a few results that we might have had in the league below where we were winning 8, 9, 10 nil in some games. The games are really, really close. Uh, we played Maidenhead who were in the, the bottom two on, on Sunday and just won 3-2 with a late winner. The standard is, is, is definitely up. And obviously when you go up the pyramid, everything improves as well. So we've we've been playing on better pitches, we've been playing at stadiums and 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 enjoying that side of it as well. But yeah, the the, the standard is is much better. The challenge is really hard. I think our first year in that national league, we we probably overachieved. We didn't think that we were going to be pushing for promotion because we we were going into a new league that we didn't know much about. But we started off very well. We kept on going and uh, finished second. Um, but in the women's league, only one team gets promoted. So we didn't get promoted and uh, we are in the same league this year and uh, currently sit in second place, probably third place with a few uh, games in hand on other teams. But yeah, the standard is very good. Uh, the players have, have had to, 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 to raise their standards. We're signing players from different areas than we've signed before. But we've still got players that played for us five, six years ago and we've got a big emphasis on developing our own players through our youth programme. Steve, I've just got to say, um, when I was looking at the league table, I knew I knew you were playing St. Austell, but I mean, that's somewhere I go on holiday for a week. Your guys went down there for for a game. I mean, that is commitment, is it not? 
huge commitment as well. We made the first, the decision to make that an overnight trip. The first time the women's team had gone to an away match overnight. So in itself, that was a, that was a challenge because the players play on a Sunday. So sometimes they work on a Saturday. Some of them got Saturday shifts. So they need to get time off work for us to, to leave the Vitality Stadium here on Saturday lunchtime. And we travelled down to St. Austell. Yeah, four and a bit hours down to there, stayed overnight bit of doubt about whether the game was on as well so we thought that we might have to do it again if it was if it was called off but we managed to play and yeah I've got to say that it can't be underestimated what the players commitment that they show to play for AFC Bournemouth fans again non-league players and women's players across the country are all doing the same but I can't speak highly enough of my players who who make time to train because they know it's important and they make time to be able to go to places like St Austell at the weekends and they love playing for AFC Bournemouth. So, you know, it's real down to the players' commitment and their desire to do well. And I love working with them from that fact. I want to ask you about another competition. We've talked about the National League. Finishing second in our first season in the National League is, is an incredible achievement. But the FA Cup has always been a really special competition for us last year. And this year, you know, we've reached the second round popper for the first time in the club's history. And it's a competition that everyone in the team really looks forward to how much does it give for you and, and the girls that play you know it's it's something that if you go far in it you can play some some fantastic teams yeah I think that's always the aim um, because of the level we play at we have to go through the qualifiers first so every t- every season we have to go through the qualifiers to get into that first round and every year we've we've pushed on and got further and further but for me as the coach in the changing room, it's probably slightly different. And Zoe, you know this because you played for me for the season. It's it's that one where we can look at it and we start to talk about dreaming. And, uh, you know, I try and set the scene for what it would be like for the players. We talk about having a dream, getting through to that la- later rounds and, and pulling out a Super League team and having our cup final day. And we're no different to any other club all the way through through the pyramids who, who, who want to... Uh, try and draw a plum tie and play a top team and uh, challenge yourself against them. So the FA Cup, for somebody who, who who used to watch that FA Cup from the TV programmes of nine o'clock in the morning till it finished at five o'clock at night and then going out and kicking a ball with my brother, the FA Cup is, uh, is, a, is a big competition and one that we want to do well in. And fortunately, we have done reasonably well over the last few years in that, but we still want to keep pushing for those, for those big cup ties. You've spoken about the growth of the team and to the extent where we're, you know, some games were going the night before and, and things like that, where it allows. How nice is it for you, you know, when you can see the girls are now involved in community sessions, player appearances, they're in the kit shoot, they're on the side of the stadium. That's a, a huge thing. Yeah, it is a huge thing. And I, it, it's a, it's immense pride that I see what the work they do. And, um, you know, we've got people that are working in schools. We've got pe- school teachers, we've got people working in the NHS, we've got people working in the community for me. And I, I see them grow. I think within the um, within the women's game, they're in the senior side a little bit earlier than they are in the men's game. So I've got currently got two 16-year-olds that are playing in the first team. I've got eight of the first team squad that are teenagers. And you have to adapt to that. You, you've got to understand that we've got 16-year-olds in the team and we've also got 28-year-olds and 32-year-olds in the team as well. So trying to create the right environment for them is is priority for me so they feel comfortable. But seeing them develop off the field but on the field as well and I think that when you look at the 16 year olds and um, I go back to a little family tale as well now I I phoned my dad unfortunately my dad passed away a couple of years ago but when I took on the job at uh, at the women's team I I I had a number of young players that were in the in the team and I was looking to pick the team for the first day and uh, I wasn't sure whether to pick a couple of 16 year olds um in Caitlin Watt and Abby Jones that uh, are still playing now. And my dad was listening to me. He doesn't know him. He doesn't know him. He lives in, he lived in Torquay. And uh, I said, dad, I've got, you know, a really promising fullback in, in Abby Jones, but she's 16. And he, and he said a few things and he gives me a bit of advice and um, he said, trust yourself. To, and we picked her and she's still playing now. And you see, see the difference they are when they're 16 to when they are become 18 to when they become 21. And, Someone like Katie Scadden, who's been our goalkeeper now for uh, for a number of years and been working in community, the work that she does in community is is absolutely fantastic and is is a great role model for the women's game. That she's doing that out in the community and performing so well, uh, training every week and playing on the matches. So credit to them for 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 what they do. But yeah, when you can step back and see the growth in them as people and players, it's really satisfying. 
Someone I just want to pick out, a 16-year-old that we have, Holly Humphreys. Now, she, earlier this season, became the first player that's played for the under-10s, the under-12s, the under-14s, the under-16s, and now the first team. Obviously, a, a huge moment for her, but that must fill you and the coaches that have brought her up with immense pride. Yeah, I, 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 I'm lucky I sit at the top of it and, you know, I get a little bit of credit for it. But, you know, the credit goes to a lot of people. I've mentioned our community staff, our girls and women's staff that work around that programme do a huge amount of work. And uh, it was, uh, I, I go out and work with the younger players as well. I think it's an important part to know what's coming through. And um, we knew that Holly was progressing very, very well um, in her under 16s age group. And uh, as soon as she turned 16, we were able to bring her into into the first team environment. And she actually played two days after her 16th birthday against the tier three side in the cup. Magnificent achievement for her to be able to do that and still be in the first team now. But it was draw it was put to my attention that that Holly was going to be the first player to go through all four of the girls' age groups in the under 10s, under 12s, under 14s, 16s. And if she makes a debut for the first team, she'd be the first player to do that. I was very conscious that that was coming, but Holly had to earn it. I wasn't going to give her a debut just because it was great for the program. But again, Holly is somebody who's, who's worked really hard. Uh, a young girl that's trying to find a way in the women's game now and finding, uh, you know, you get, two steps forward, one back, and then you've got to keep learning and developing. And I think that's an important part of what I keep saying to the younger players, keep learning, keep developing. But yeah, great achievement for Holly. And uh, hopefully uh, she'll go on to, to even bigger things with us. Playing every single week as a 16-year-old is, uh, is a good achievement for her. Talking of growth, April 2022, a big moment. The women's team played their first competitive fixture here at Vitality Stadium. Just give us your memories of that day. It was it was fantastic. I think in the tunnel we had all their uh you know their their squad numbers up, their shirts up. It was it was a great moment, wasn't it? Oh, it was it was a memorable moment. We still talk about it now as 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 we do as as a squad. Um the build up to it was was incredible. So many people, including yourself Zoe and the media team and the branding and everybody here at the football club just got right behind the women's team and made them feel really special, you know, putting pictures of up, up in the tunnel or the interviews that were going on beforehand or the adv advertising of the game. It was with mixed emotions for me because we were in second place in the league and um, I knew it was a special day for the women's team. It was a special day for the girls and women's programme because we're highlighting what can be achieved and playing out on that pitch. And we wanted the, the, it to be a real showcase event. But we were getting close to the end of the season and we needed three points as well. So I had this balance between trying to keep the team focused on trying to win and not let the occasion get the better of them. But we kept on getting an update on the crowd and we're normally playing in front of 200 people. And I think 200 was sold out on the first day. And then Jazz in the ticket office kept on speaking to me and we sold 500, we sold 800, we sold 1,000, got the 1,500. And you could just see it on the players' faces. It was the biggest crowd they've ever going to play on I think it finished up at 1,600 was, was the attendance but again the players were unbelievable on the day to, to to put the performance in that they put in with all that was going on for them to win 4-1 get the three points and celebrate and being able to celebrate with the and they still talk about it now and uh, fortunately we've got another game coming up this year and uh, hopefully we can do as well in that game as well because I don't think we can underestimate what it means to play at the Vitality Stadium. I remind myself every day, I walk through the doors, it's my job and I walk through here for for every day for 20 years and you can forget what a special place this is. But when you get the opportunity to play out on that pitch or come in here for a community event, it's a special place and the players really enjoyed that. And uh, again, credit to them for a magnificent performance and uh, handling the situation and where they've done. And what they wanted to do was to inspire young people to be players for football football players in the future and I think they did that well on that day Is that another exclusive for the AFC Bournemouth podcast Steve there's another game at Vitality Stadium what can you tell us about that There is we are playing a league match again um, we, we wanted to make sure it's a league match and moving on from the friendlies that we, we've previously done um, off the back of the Chesham game last year so Sunday the 16th of April we are playing Maidenhead here at the Vitality Stadium it would be fantastic if we could match the 1,600 or even go better and beat that. Uh, if you've never seen the team play before, 
come along and have a look at them. They're they're good players who who work exceptionally hard and are very proud to play for AFC Bournemouth. And uh, hopefully you enjoy it if you come along. Steve, I, I looking at the league table. I know you're second, and I know the team that got relegated last season, the top of the league, Cardiff. That just sort of shows you the strength of of the women's structure. What are your hopes for the rest of this season? Yeah, our hopes for the rest of the season is to put some pressure on the top two, for sure. The, the, the league is very much different to what it was last year. As you say, four teams got relegated down from the Premier Division, which made our league really strong. And Cardiff have started off exceptionally well with, uh, I think it was nine straight wins and put themselves top of the league. They've they've recently lost the game. And Exeter are a very, very good side. So they're the top two sides. And I think there's a number of other good sides in the league in Southampton and Moneyfields and Chelsea that are all putting some pressure on. So, you know, without telling you too much what I say in the changing room, I've said we're in a little mini league at the moment where we've got to try and win the games that we've got coming up to put some pressure on the top two. And that's our job at the moment to try and just keep winning, put some pressure on the top two. And, uh, we were back to our first game on Sunday against Maidenhead, as it was, without playing for six weeks. And again, credit to the players, without playing for six weeks, we managed to win that game with a late winner. And now we've got a nice run of games coming up and hopefully we can try and win those games and put some pressure on the top two. Steve, England winning the Euros, women's Euros in the summer and the, the whole general um, the women's game is just mushroomed and blossoming everywhere. Have you noticed that? At our level? Massively, yeah. So my role is the community. Um, so many phone calls, so many emails, so many girls wanted to come and play. Absolutely brilliant. So again, it's, it's us adjusting to, to what we need to our community. So we have more girl sessions that we've, we've ever had before within AFC Bournemouth community. Young girls from the age of five, six, seven, being able to come along, enjoy football, play at a recreational level. And then, of course, from there, if they, they want to, they can go into teams. And we've got a lot of connection with local uh, uh, youth teams. Those that show the, the potential and talent come into our, into our Bournemouth pathway. And it allows us to, to engage with nearly now 400 girls on a weekly basis during that pathway. Um, and then hopefully we get more Holly Humphreys that going from the under 10s all the way up through to, to play in that first team. But yeah, the Lionesses, what a great summer that was. And um, I think everybody, any every single person in the women's game has benefit, benefited from that, along with the men's game as well, because it's uh, it's been a magnificent achievement for them to, to, to win the Euros and uh, one that we've all benefited from with uh, more spotlight on the women's game now. You've obviously been around um, the men's non-league circle for for a long period of time and we all know that players are getting paid some players are getting paid at that level now how does that fit into the women's game it must get to the stage where if you're going to progress you eventually may have to think about paying players is that fair to say yeah absolutely and we're at a level where some of our opposition do get paid so there's another challenge in terms of uh, of trying to be competitive in the league that we're in um, we are certainly always looking at how we restructure the women's team and go forward with that. So it's it's something that's being looked at right now in terms of what the structure might look like for next season. And yeah, that might include some kind of budget. It may not, but it, it certainly that's where the women's game is going in terms of, of matching what some of the men's non-league teams have. But also at the, up at the top end, more professional contracts for the women's players because... That will allow them to focus on football. As I've detailed before, some of our players are, are working long shifts at work, jumping straight in their cars, getting changed, coming to training, working hard at training, eating their evening meal at 10 o'clock at night and trying to be prepared for games at the weekend, which is credit to them. Um, but anything we can do to help and move that forward, that's certainly something that I'm looking at all the time to try and help with. And travelling to St. Austell, Maidenhead and Cardiff and places like that, Steve? Yeah, there's a few that fall asleep on the bus on the way down. But uh, yeah, there's uh, there's some travelling involved in our league as well. well obviously, where we're positioned uh, on, on, the, on the south coast, we have to do a little bit of travelling. But I think that's nice because the girls get on well with each other and uh, get on the bus together and um, socialise. And um, yeah, it's good to be able to do that along with, the, which is a little bit of a joke with one or two of the uh, younger girls doing their homework. So that's the that's the age range we have on the uh, on the squad. One or two have got to do their homework and one or two are catching up on sleep from work. Both hats are going to be needed for this one, Steve. I know that you play your home games at Ringwood Town's Long, Long Lane headquarters. Just tell us about this developing relationship with Ringwood Town? 
Yeah, I think it's um, something that we wanted to to have for a number of years in community. When when I come up with an idea around a community project, the first thing I have to do is find a venue to be able to run it from. We've never had a, the 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 joy of having our own facility. So the opportunity came up a number of years ago to start talking to Ringwood Town about developing their facilities and um, delighted to say, again, different business skills, different hats I've had to put on in terms of developing um, a, a football foundation bid that has been accepted for us to, to, to redevelop Ringwood Town. And uh, Andy, who works for me, has worked tirelessly on putting those bids together as well. And uh, we are very, very close to having the first part of it finished in the build, which is a full size 3G pitch. And again, that's crucial for the development of community activities and girls and women's program because of the weather that we have and so many uh, matches being called off and only being able to play it on artificial pitches. We we now own our artificial pitch, which we hope will be open from mid-February. And then we go for phase two, which is the building of the new uh, pavilion and changing rooms at, uh, at Ringwood and then updating and modernising the car park so we can accommodate everything that we need to. And with a hopefully a finish around uh, November time of this year. But for me, so excited, uh, you know, I say 20 years in a job and I'm still getting excited about a new venture. And it's a new venture where we got our own facility we can decide what goes on there i can do even more community work now i can do even more girls and women's sessions if we can find some time but we will find that time because that's what we're passionate about in doing so it it allows us to be able to really shape and and drive it forward and i suppose you know again in in reply to zoe's earlier question can we expand and can we go and where's it going hopefully this will take us to another level as well now I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked you earlier about the Community Sports Trust, but I want you to put your women's hat on. How do you think the new ownership can affect the women's side of the game? We've heard Bill speaking about it. You mentioned that he's been down already to watch an under-14s training session. Again, it must be hugely exciting. Yeah, having the opportunity to speak to Bill, um, I can see his passion for it. I can see his passion for the the women, uh, the women's football, but women in sport. And uh, we had a great conversation and uh, about what he would like to do with, with the women's team and... Uh, you know, we'll work together. We'll work together on that. And we'll work with Jim, who's who's in post as well now, to really um, drive that forward uh, alongside Neil Blake and others to to really kind of like push the women's game on and provide opportunities. It's it's That's the key bit for me. It's about providing opportunities. Um, we've, we've done that with, with our current setup, but continuously trying to open up doors, provide opportunities and let people reach their potential. You know, we've got some really good players within our within our girls and women's programme. We want them to feel their potential here at AFC Bournemouth and not feel that they need to move on to perhaps a Super League club or higher. Perhaps our ambitions are to keep moving the club forward so that it reaches, reaches their ambitions as well. Steve, just give us a message for any AFC Bournemouth supporter who hasn't watched a women's game, how much you want to see them down there. Yeah, come along. Come along and watch them. Yeah, you've, you've heard a little bit now... Um, about their backgrounds and the commitment levels that they put into it. They've got a huge amount of pride in playing for AFC Bournemouth. They love wearing the shirt. They love saying that they are AFC Bournemouth players. They would love the support as well. The support we get is fantastic. We'd love to see even more of you come down. Hopefully you won't be disappointed. You'll see some good football matches, some competitive football matches uh, and a team that is trying to play the AFC Bournemouth way. And what I will say on that is all... Bournemouth women's fixtures are available on afcv.co.uk entries always free every Sunday two o'clock down at Ringwood here at Vitality Stadium wherever it might be uh, I couldn't agree more it's a fantastic team to get behind Steve we've thoroughly enjoyed having you here on our podcast thank you so much for taking the time to come in talk to us we've heard some great stories and thoroughly enjoyed your company thank you now if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast we'd love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on we'd also be very grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans be it the AFC Bournemouth related fans or the general football fan can enjoy it too our thanks again to Steve Cuss and from Neil Perrett and myself Zoe Rundle thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast